that's, uh, that's just like the welcome I received when I went to Blackwater's founder's hometown. <laughs> Almost identical. When his uncle came up to me and told me to stop messing with Eric Prince because he's doing the Lord's work with Blackwater. <laughs> that's not a joke. Um, I, I, I want to begin, first of all, by uh, thanking the organizers of this conference. You know, I, not all of us share the same ideology uh, or necessarily share the same uh, political view of what it means to be in a movement. Uh, but I think all of us uh, are united on basic principles of opposing this war, of calling for economic justice, of being against the death penalty, of uh, believing that those who do harm to others do not speak for the people of this country. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And it's, it's so great when you look at the roster of people speaking, the, the veterans who are coming back and sharing stories. And it's so important uh, to hear that testimony uh, of those that have been on the front lines in Iraq and are coming back and saying no uh, to the war. And I think that it's important that so many veterans are rising up and calling for an immediate withdrawal from Iraq, not 18 months, not six months, not 40,000 troops and 160,000 mercenaries, but an immediate withdrawal from Iraq. And so thank you to those vets who bravely have stood up. I also want to extend a personal thank you to Anthony Arnov, who uh, was my agent on this book and reviewed the manuscript many times. Without Anthony's uh, incredible dedication, this book would have never happened. And I want to personally thank you, Anthony, for all your work. <laughs> Anthony told me in 1995 that I needed to write a book. And at that point, it was on something else. And every year since, he's come up with a different idea. And finally, we found one that landed. <laughs> well, I, I want to. Uh, begin tonight by reading a short section uh, from the book. I promise you I won't read any more sections from the book, but I want to open up with something that was the uh, definitive uh, moment in many ways of the Iraq occupation as of uh, the spring of 2004. And many of you probably remember this incident. It would prove incredibly pivotal in the course that the war and the occupation would take. And it happened on the morning of March 31st, 2004 in the Iraqi city of Fallujah. When the four Americans rolled into Fallujah in their two Piero jeeps, the Iraqi Mujahideen and the city of mosques were waiting for them. The main drag that cuts through the city is lined with restaurants, cafes, and souks, and on ordinary days, throngs of people mill around. But early that morning, a small group of masked men had detonated an explosive device, clearing the streets and causing shopkeepers to shutter their stores. From the moment the convoy of Americans entered the city limits of Fallujah, the men stood out. They were driving vehicles known widely in Iraq as bullet magnets. They were sporting wraparound sunglasses and Tom Cruise haircuts. Shortly after they entered Fallujah, the Jeeps began to slow. To their right were shops and markets. To the left, open space. They'd hit some sort of a roadblock. As the vehicles came to a standstill, a grenade was hurled at the rear Jeep, quickly followed by the rip of machine gun fire. Bullets tore through the side of the rear pyro like salt through ice, fatally wounding the two men inside. As the blood gushed from them, masked gunmen moved in on the jeeps, unloading cartridges of ammo and pounding their way through the windshield. Chants of Allah Akbar, God is great, filled the air. Soon more than a dozen young men who'd been hanging out in front of a local kebab house joined in the frenzy. By the time the rear jeep was shot up, the Americans in the lead vehicle realized that an ambush was underway. They tried to flee or to turn around and help their wounded comrades, but it was too late. The crowd quickly swelled to more than 300 people as the original attackers faded into the side streets of Fallujah. The jeeps were soon engulfed in flames, and men and boys literally tore the men apart limb from limb. In front of TV cameras, a young man held a small sign emblazoned with a skull and crossbones that declared in English, Fallujah is the graveyard of the Americans. The mob hung the charred, lifeless remains of the men from a bridge over the Euphrates River where they would remain for hours, forming an eerily iconic image that was seen on television screens throughout the world. Thousands of miles away in Washington, D.C., President Bush was on the campaign trail speaking at a fundraiser dinner. This collection of killers is trying to shake our will, the president told his supporters. America will never be intimidated by thugs and assassins. We're aggressively striking the terrorists in Iraq. We will defeat them there so we do not have to face them in our own country. The next morning, Americans woke up to the news of the gruesome killings. 
Iraqi mob mutilates four American civilians was a typical newspaper headline. In fact, it was the headline of the Chicago Tribune. Somalia was frequently invoked, referring to the incident in October of 1993 when rebels in Mogadishu shot down two Black Hawk helicopters, killed 18 US soldiers, and dragged some of them through the streets, prompting the Clinton administration to withdraw forces. But unlike Somalia, the men killed at Fallujah were not members of the US military, nor were they civilians, as many news outlets reported. They were highly trained private soldiers sent to Iraq by a secretive mercenary company based in the wilderness of North Carolina. Its name is Blackwater USA. I think for many people, even those who very closely uh, follow the war and follow US foreign policy, it came as some news that there were these heavily armed private soldiers operating in Iraq. Most of the public that was paying attention had heard of Halliburton which is the largest uh, war contractor, primarily because of the relationship between Halliburton and Vice President Dick Cheney. Of course, Cheney was the head of Halliburton, then he became the Vice President, and Halliburton gets all these no-bid contracts and favorable financial arrangements. But this idea of armed mercenaries working on behalf of the US government in a war zone was a relatively new development. Of course, the Central Intelligence Agency and other agencies had used uh, mercenaries for covert operations. They were used in Vietnam, they've been used throughout history, but never in the scope that we're seeing right now in Iraq. Most people in this country believe that there are about 145,000 to 170,000 U.S. troops on the ground in Iraq right now. What's almost never mentioned in the public discourse or debate on this issue is the fact that there are 130,000 private personnel deployed alongside those 145,000 active duty US forces. This is an effective doubling of the size of the occupation force. And why does the Bush administration want to use these private personnel? Well, first of all, we know that over 4,000 US soldiers have died in Iraq. We know that over 25,000 have been wounded. I actually think the number is much higher, but that's the conservative estimate of the military. We don't know how many of these mercenaries have been killed serving the occupation in Iraq. We know that at least 917 of them have died in Iraq since March of 2003, 917. We know that in the first three months of this year, about 146 of them died. Those numbers are not included in the official death count. They help to mask the toll of the war. Now, I said that we know that 917 have died. The reason we know that is because their families have applied for federal death benefits under something called the Defense Base Act, so only those private personnel whose families have applied for these death benefits, only through the Department of Labor are we able to track these forces. But what's more disturbing is that the Bush administration uses these forces and approaches their use very differently than the use of active duty US soldiers. If you're a, if you're a soldier in Iraq and you extrajudicially kill an Iraqi, you could be court-martialed for it. Now there have been 64 courts martial of US soldiers in Iraq on murder-related charges alone, a, a stunningly low number, given the severity of the crimes that we've seen unfold in Iraq. But there have been 64 courts martial on murder-related charges. With hundreds of thousands of private personnel working for companies like DynCor, Triple Canopy, Blackwater, KBR, Fleur, Aranus, Armor Group, the list goes on and on. Hundreds of thousands of contractors, as they're called now, working for these companies have gone in and out of Iraq. 64 US soldiers court-martialed on murder-related charges. Out of those 100,000, 100,000, 100,000 contractors going in and out of the country, two have been prosecuted for any crimes. One of them pled guilty to possession of child pornography images on his computer at Abu Ghraib prison. The other was a KBR employee accused of stabbing a coworker in a kitchen. Neither of the contractors prosecuted were charged with crimes against Iraqi, Iraqis, and neither of them were armed contractors like those that work for Blackwater. So either we have tens of thousands of the most saintly Boy Scout mercenaries running around Iraq, or something is fundamentally wrong with the system. You see, what the Bush administration has done is to replace whatever semblance or concept of diplomacy existed anymore in this country. The idea in the original Gulf War, 1991, of Bush's father was, I'm going to build a coalition of willing nations. And he got a, a number of Arab nations on board, and the key one was Saudi Arabia. 
Well, Bush failed to build a coalition of willing nations. So instead, he built a coalition of billing corporations. And those billing corporations have descended on Iraq to a point where the Times of London said that the post-war boom in Iraq is not oil, it's private security. And by using the private sector to service your war, you take away the constraints of the nation state. And you now make your pool of potential soldiers or cannon fodder for your war the poor of the world. So companies like Blackwater can go in and aggressively recruit in Latin America and hire up mercenaries from companies with countries with, see the slip, countries with horrible human rights records and then deploy them in Iraq as part of this so-called coalition of the willing. Now I'm going to return to all of this bigger picture in a little while, but what I want to do now is, is talk a little bit about the origins of Blackwater, who started it, uh, who are the men that are running the company, and what are they looking to uh, for tomorrow. You see, Blackwater is one of 180 mercenary companies that are operating in Iraq right now. It's not the biggest of them. It's not the most profitable. Yes, 180 mercenary companies. And when I say mercenary, I don't mean KBR. You can make an argument that KBR is a mercenary force, but their forces aren't armed. There are 181 companies operating in Iraq right now that provide private, heavily armed soldiers. Blackwater is viewed not as the Ford of the industry, but as the Maserati. There's less of them, but they're considered more desirable. Blackwater was founded by a man named Eric Prince. Eric Prince is uh, believed to be one of the wealthiest people ever to serve in the elite US Navy SEALs. He comes from the state of Michigan, just across the lake here, from a town called Holland. And his father was a, a, a very successful businessman. During the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, in Michigan, he built up a company called Prince Manufacturing. And Prince Manufacturing was perhaps best known for an invention that many people have in their cars as they drive around today, the now ubiquitous lighted sun visor. If you pull down the visor in your car and it lights up, you have a bit of Blackwater's history riding around in your vehicle. So Eric Prince grows up in this house where his father is running this billion dollar uh, business. But more important than watching his dad run the business, was watching him use the company as a cash generating engine to fuel and fund the rise of the Republican Revolution of 1994 and the rise of what we now know as the radical religious right in this country. It was Eric Prince's father, Edgar Prince, who gave the seed money to Gary Bauer to start the Family Research Council. Eric Prince was in the first team of interns that Gary Bauer took on. Gary Bauer, of course, is not just a radical religious right leader. He was one of the original signers of the Project for a New American Century, the neoconservative agenda that was adopted by the Bush White House. They also